Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Lugartum Institute uh, on evening day of great, certainly historic importance in the affairs of the Conservative Party, the party of government, of the British government, of the British constitution, of the European constitution, as all of these undercurrents come to the surface and collide and create a whole new political and constitutional order. A generation and more ago, undergraduates reading history would often be asked to study a paper devoted solely to the topic of constitutional history. And so some of us uh, devoted ourselves to the study of uh, medieval courts, and then things got a bit more interesting in the 17th century, the collision between king and parliament. And then we sighed and we thought, gosh, constitutional history is boring, when we got into the 18th and 19th and early 20th century. And then we would escape, liberated to study the more exciting, as we thought of it, the areas of political history and social history. Well, how wrong we were to have had so dismissive a view of constitutional documents. Constitutions, as all of us now know, uh, to our cost or to our benefit, have real meaning in terms of real passions and objective social and economic interests. And it is to the study in as almost neutrally objective a way as we can manage really this evening of the constitutional implications, constitutional and legal implications of the process of Brexit that we have here assembled this evening. And we are very delighted to have as our guests here at the Institute this evening, Geoffrey Robertson, who writes with great authority and erudition, not only in matters legal and constitutional, but also historical. I've saved up for reading uh, his book on the trial of King Charles I, one of the great celebrated accounts of uh, the constitutional dramas of that period. And we have Ellen, Alan Rennick um, of the Constitutional Units at University College London, he will speak with authority um, on the political dimension um, as well as the legal one. And we have Catherine Barnard, who's fellow at Trinity College, Cambridge, and professor of European law at the University of Cambridge. She wishes it to be known <coughs> that uh, for various, I think what's known in university circles these days, funding reasons, uh, she wishes to be as objective as possible. Indeed, is pledged to a severe objectivity. Like the BBC. Just like the BBC. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Would that that had been so during the, during the dramas that have befallen us most recently. Um, I'm going to uh, start by uh, asking uh, one question really, uh, from each of our panellists in turn and invite them to consider it. Um, and first of all, this business of sovereignty and democracy. One of the, for me, I think, the peculiarities of the debate during the referendum was the way in which so many people thought, seemed to think, that sovereignty was the same thing as democratic will or the expression of the majority will. But it isn't, is it? No. Jeff oh, it never has been. The great British genius is to ensure that the democracy doesn't turn into the tyranny of the people or the tyranny of the mob. We have a system that is based on the, what we call, as lawyers, the Queen in Parliament, which means the right of MPs to make or break laws and the right of the peers to block it. That is our parliamentary system of parliamentary sovereignty. The uh, MP is not uh, we, we don't have uh, direct democracy. Uh, the MP is bound to act according to his or her conscience or according, uh, and according to what they think is best for Britain. Now, this was famously uh, one of the 
oddities you must understand is that Britain is one of only two countries in the world with Saudi Arabia which doesn't have a constitution. We have a constitution unit, but in my view we don't have a constitution. Uh, we have a lot of conventions, a lot of history. We've given democratic constitutions to all sorts of other Commonwealth countries. We wrote them down for them in the 1960 Westminster democracy. But ourselves, we don't have it. And the referendum as a sort of a way or intrusion into government is not part of our history. It's a very silly way to make a decision on complex issues. Uh, it has played its part in Europe in 1931 and 1933, it was a referenda that brought Hitler to power, which is why the Germans excluded from their constitution. The French uh, ha do have referenda, they have two, first for the heart and the second for the head. Now, most countries which have referenda built in uh, have what is called a supermajority, usually two thirds. It doesn't. But when our parliament, our sovereign parliament, decided in 2015 to have a referendum on Brexit, uh, they didn't put in anything about whether it would be binding or whether it was uh, any sort of majority, 51.1 versus 49.9. And in the end, we have a result where 37% of electors <coughs> vote for Brexit, 35 vote against, and 28% don't vote at all. What sort of majority uh, is that? What kind of way? It's alien, as I say, to our tradition, and parliamentary sovereignty requires that Parliament, the MPs, and eventually the peers, uh, decide this issue because in 1972 we passed the European Communities Act. It's still the law and it will remain the law, that it was the law that brought us into Europe, until Parliament votes to take it out of Europe. And I would have thought that any MP in London, Scotland, uh, Northern Ireland, or anyone whose constituency voted uh, to remain would be entitled and should uh, vote against any repeal of that law. As far as the interesting question, uh, two questions. First of all, what about MPs whose uh, constituents voted to Brexit? When you read constitution, <laughs> constitutional law in this absurd country without a constitution. One of the documents that is given to you is Edmund Burke's famous speech to the electors of Bristol who thought that they could control the actions of their MP. And Burke in wonderful Burkean language uh, explained to them that that is something they could not do, that the elector, the MP for Bristol, was when elected the MP for Britain, making his, as then it was, his decision according to his conscience and what was best for Britain. So uh, it is quite open to MPs to keep us in Europe by refusing to repeal that act, and it is, as a matter of parliamentary sovereignty, that's what we're all about. And it is quite, of course, if the vote comes in November, things might be quite different. The pound may have dropped even further. It may just be too difficult uh, to negotiate the exit. We might have President Trump uh, in November and feel that uh, a stronger Europe is rather necessary. You know, all sorts of things may happen. So uh, at the end of the day, I think both sides in the campaign told this one great lie. It was a lie of omission. They didn't tell the public because it didn't suit their rhetoric that the referendum was advisory only and wasn't binding in law. Uh, because, of course, the Remainers wanted to pretend it would be a great catastrophe. And the uh, Brexiteers wanted to say this is a once in a lifetime op opportunity. So, so the referendum rhetoric was conducted on the basis that this referendum was binding. But it is not in law and the basic constitutional principle in this country, and it's been said that the great contribution that Britain has made to democracy is 
the checks and balances idea that it is not the tyranny of the mob, uh, so that uh, it is, there is still something to play for, and uh, it may well be played for. Well, Finn and Alan together, um, let's fast forward a few years. Uh, Mrs. May has had her several boxing matches with uh, Jean-Claude Juncker. She has emerged triumphant with a package deal. Only Parliament can vote to repeal legislation that it has itself passed. And this package is then presented, first of all, to the House of Commons. And let us also assume, uh, which is fairly reasonable working hypothesis, that a great majority of members of the House of Commons remain opposed to Brexit. Are we then in a real classic kind of constitutional impasse? What would your advice be to the backbencher with a conscience, the Burke of his or her day, who wishes to say to the constituents of Bristol Railsware, I owe you my conscience, which is what Burke said, nothing else. Which of you would like to go first? I would say that that backbencher should call for a second referendum. I, uh, so I, I, I disagree somewhat with what Geoffrey said. I think uh, to uh, espouse timeless constitutional verities without any regard to public opinion is a little bit dangerous. Uh, because public opinion might bite. And Sorry, which timeless verities are these? The, the timeless verities about parliamentary sovereignty. Mm -hmm. uh, I think an expectation has been created in this referendum, as Geoffrey suggested, that, uh, that the result of the referendum will be respected. And I think it would be very dangerous for Parliament to go against that without uh, returning to the people for a second verdict. I mean, it seems to me entirely appropriate that there should be a second referendum in the circumstances that you've just outlined. Indeed, it may be entirely appropriate to have a sec second referendum, whatever public opinion might do over the next few years, because this first referendum took place when the public had no ability to know what they were voting for in the leave option because the leave option wasn't clearly specified. And, and, and most <coughs> broadcasting and output failed to scrutinise the claims put by both parties. Well, uh, yes, I think that's an, another issue. Uh, I mean, I think th there are two issues. What, one is simply that we don't know what the leave package is because it hasn't been negotiated yet. A second issue... Uh, yes, stop until... Yes, quite. Well, it still doesn't exist, yes. Uh, but a, a second issue, you're quite right, is that uh, the quality of the debate in the referendum was pitiful uh, and uh, uh, many people on both sides uh, didn't uh, make their decision on solid groundings as to how to vote. Uh, and I think certainly before we hold a second referendum, we ought to think very seriously about how to hold referendums in a better way. Because, yes. I mean, I do agree with Geoffrey absolutely that uh, the tyranny of the majority is dangerous and if you're going to hold referendums then you need to hold them in a way that will encourage quality debate, careful scrutiny uh, and clearly we did not do that in mm -hmm. this referendum. Thank you. What, now again in a neutral manner I want you to think about, about this, this, this poor person, she or he, um, Passionate Remainer, but the package has come back. Decisions got to be made. What's your advice? Yeah, I think uh, there is possibility of a second referendum. I would agree very much with what we've just heard. I would also say that um, what was very striking the, uh, during the referendum campaign, as I say, I'm being funded by the UK and a Changing Europe programme, which is funded by the ESRC. And one of our obligations was to go to town halls and explain to people in as neutral a way as possible what the EU is about. Um, and the level of complete incomprehension was, um, as you would expect, high. This is not a, 
a criticism of the individuals, they're quite the contrary. It's a total failure of our education system. Um, and there's been a very steep learning curve for a very large number of people. And of course, it's very easy to carp at the failures of the BBC um, and the other broadcasters, but they did do their best in terms of reality checks and fact checking and so forth. And what we've now got is actually quite a body of information out there for people to make a much more informed decision. And of course, these decisions that they were making were made against a backcloth of 20 years longer of a very hostile um, press, which um, is still extremely hostile and will continue to be. Mm. Um, and the classic example of that we see over migration. Um, if you look at the uh, range of um, headlines and front page stories in the Daily Express, the Mail and the Sun, the word migrant is forever used as a dirty word and it confuses both um, uh, within EU migration, so economic migrants who've got a right to move as the law stands at the moment, uh, refugees, asylum seekers um, who are coming from Syria and elsewhere, and also economic migrants coming from other countries. And they are all thrown into the same pot. And there was no disaggregation of those and their different entitlements. And it's complicated. The law's complicated on all of this. But the fact is that migration became such a, a dirty and, and, and vexed term. And it's a price that we're um, paying at the moment. In respect to your specific question, can there be a second referendum? Of course there can be, because um, we don't have a written constitution, so we have nothing which prescribes how to go forward. The question more interesting... And because we have a representative democracy well, and not it, a popular democracy. Indeed, but given that we have launched the popular route through the first referendum, um, I certainly am not of the school that there should be a second referendum straight away. I think this would be the worst of all outcomes because a lot of people would say this is typical of the elite, typical of the EU. This is what happened in Ireland. This is what happened in Denmark. Uh, they're kept told to keep voting until they get the right answer. We can't do that, but we do need to have, if, if there's going to be a second referendum, there's got to be a range of alternatives. And one of them is actually to stay in. Uh, I disagree with those who say that when the Article 50 process is launched, it can't be um, stopped before the end of the process. Uh, one would be to stay in, so the status quo. One would be what the new house will look like, to use Tony Blair's terms. And one would be to get out altogether. But there, it's high risks with all of that. Oh. Well, let's stay uh, on Article 50 for uh, the second issue that I want to raise, all three of you. Um, it's, it's become rather the, the 1066 and all that kind of phrase of this particular referendum debate, much, uh, much invoked. Um, but, Alan, let's start with you. What is Article 50? Why does it matter? Are you as attached to it as some people, as many other people seem to be? Well, uh, so Article 50 is the bit of the Lisbon Treaty that sets out the process by which a member state of the European Union can leave the European Union. Um, it matters because, and this relates to the third point as well, I guess, oh. it's the only way you can leave the European Union. Uh, and the Leave campaign during the campaign made various arguments about how there were various routes to leaving that would not involve invoking Article 50 because they uh, saw that, in certain respects at least, Article 50 gives the power to the remaining member states rather than to the UK, mm -hmm. and they didn't like that. Uh, but none of them have been mentioning this since the referendum, <laughs> which mm -hmm. is a pretty good indication that they know that there is no route other than Article 50. Mm -hmm. uh, Geoffrey, are you an Article 50 man? Well, I don't... Article 50 is there. You do with it what you can. Article 50 says that we can serve notice in accordance with our own constitutional mm. arrangements. And to me, our constitutional arrangements, even though we don't have a constitution, our quasi-constitutional arrangements uh, require parliamentary <coughs> sovereignty. And we can't serve notice unless and until we uh, repeal the 1972 European uh -huh. Communities Act. And that seems to me quite straightforward. Whether it will be quite so straightforward to the courts, uh, we wait to see. I think there's one case coming on before Ross Cranston, who was mm. there as Attorney General, is now a High Court judge. Uh, next week, Mishkon Dorea are there and the, the ambulance chasing brigade <laughs> ready to uh, act. Whether um, they've announced it already, uh, no doubt other lawyers will 
see, to get in the act, and the more the merrier, because it is a great constitutional issue as to whether we can even start the Article 50 process without uh, a vote in Parliament. And uh, that will no doubt play itself up to the Supreme Court in about a year's time. Hmm. So uh, I wouldn't then. think that Article 50... But of course the government lawyers uh, have taken the view, I think the wrong view, that Article 50 is something is, is, uh, can be triggered under the royal prerogative. Hmm. Now this is an absurd view. To, to wheel out this medieval idea uh, that the government, the king, has this royal power to override parliament is unsustainable ever since 1648 and certainly unsustainable after the GCHQ case in 1984 which said that the royal prerogative uh, which was used to try and keep GCHQ from uh, judicial review or investigation uh, was uh, judicially reviewable. So royal prerogative or not uh, you're going to get a year of uh, discussion, an important constitutional discussion, <coughs> actually, uh, in the courts. That's a pleasure in store. Yeah. Well, one important feature of the royal prerogative, as kings tried to exercise it in the Middle Ages in England, was that it kept being contested by the papacy. And contests between papacy and, and crown, between, as it were, church and state, consistent feature of the Middle Ages. I mean, it's, um, uh, I mustn't go on too long about all that kind of stuff. Nonetheless, it does point out, I think, something very important. That when people talk about sovereignty as being the same thing as the unitary state, always, always has to be contained. It was not always like that in England. There is a, a history that is different. Um, but this Article 50 stuff, it's going to take years and afterwards, don't you think? Well, the reason, I mean, for, for those who are, who are slightly less well-versed in Article 50, the reason why the, the question about trigger is so important is, in addition to the constitutional requirements, is that once it's triggered, the clock starts ticking and you have two years. And uh, the only power the leaving state has is um, when deciding when to trigger. And if you think about it, you've got two years, that two years can be extended, but it can only be extended by unanimous agreement of 27 member states, and there is a vested interest in some member states not to be cooperative uh, for their own domestic reasons. And, of course, if you just think about it practically, when you've, well, the moment it's been triggered, um, the uh, European uh, Council um, must give guidelines uh, for the negotiation, and those guidelines may take some time to be drawn up, uh, and all of that time will eat into the precious two years. Furthermore, we've got in 2017, you've got the French and German elections, so the French and German government's minds will be on other matters, not um, uh, the UK problem. Um, and the risk is that if the clock starts ticking once it's triggered, um, then uh, we risk having a disorderly exit because the presumption is if there is no agreement and no extension, the treaties stop applying. And to my mind, that would be really quite disastrous for the UK because if you just think about the gamut of issues that need to be resolved, I'll give you a quick list, the obvious ones we know about, the position of UK, uh, EU nationals in the UK and UK nationals in the EU. But there are lots of others that you might not think about straight away. In the university context, research grants five, have been running, or have been funded for five years. What happens to them? What happens to the UK nationals who are working for the EU institutions? What about their pension liability? What about the European investment banks with, lo bank with loans which may be of a 20 year or longer duration? What about all of those, the agencies um, which are currently based in London, all of which need to be relocated, all the staff need to be re relocated and probably compensation payable. What about uh, regional funds uh, and the state of play with them? Yeah, what yeah. about agricultural stuff? The, 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 I mean, this is just a list. And to give you a flavour, I was very struck, um, this is not original to me, but I was very struck um, to hear the former cabinet secretary say that the only other state that left the EU was Greenland. 
a uh, population the size of Croydon, one issue which was fisheries, and it huh. took three years to negotiate. And this really puts it in perspective how long this might take. Now, in one sense, how long will this take? How long's a piece of string? You can have as many views as there are of us in the room. But um, even Michael Gove had been talking, even in the run-up to the referendum, of it taking up to about six years, possibly longer. Some people say 10. We have no idea, but this, the, re the reason why there's so much fuss over the practical aspects of Article 50, let alone the constitutional aspects um, that Jeffrey's just been talking about, is because what's got to be done in that two-year period. Hmm. Whole careers may indeed be spent um, in the unravelling of this uh, particular issue. But there's uh, a third question that I'm going to ask you to comment on before um, we begin to approach the questions which I can see forming um, on, the, on the mouths of the audience as I, as I look at you this evening. The question of, well, Scotland. The Scottish question, lineal successor to the Irish question. <laughs> Which, of course, as somebody once famously said, the problem about the Irish question is that every time the English thought they had a reply, the Irish changed the question. What's the Scottish question now? Do you think it exists? Oh, yes, definitely. Uh, there's also the Irish question, of course. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, so the Scottish question clearly is that Scotland voted by a large majority to remain within the European Union uh, and uh, the Scottish government has indicated, has long indicated, that it might take uh, a vote for Brexit uh, as a material change in the circumstances of the Union that would justify calling for a second referendum on independence in Scotland. Um, the mere fact that uh, the referendum vote uh, would uh, take Scotland out against its will is already a very significant uh, problem in Scotland. The process of Brexit might compound that problem mm -hmm. because in order to leave the EU, at least in order to leave the EU cleanly, we have to remove uh, from the Scotland Act, the mm -hmm. law that created the Scottish Parliament, the current provision that requires the Scottish Parliament to uh, adhere to EU law. Um, in order to do that, in order to change the terms of the Scotland Act, under convention, a thing called the Sewell Convention, uh, the Scottish Parliament ought to give its consent. It is manifestly obvious that the Scottish Parliament will not give its consent. Therefore, either the Westminster Parliament has to override the wishes of the Scottish Parliament on an issue of fundamental importance on which 62% of the Scottish people have expressed a view in a referendum, or, uh, well, or we don't leave and Scottish, Scotland in effect ha has a veto, or conceivably we do leave and the Scottish Parliament continues to have to adhere to EU law even though we're not in the EU law, not in the EU, which is very messy. Uh, so, um, the process of Brexit complicates this uh, issue further. I don't think it makes Scottish independence inevitable uh, because while clearly these things will increase uh, antagonism towards the Union, the UK, in Scotland, um, the Brexit also makes Scottish independence much less attractive mm. uh, because uh, if it is necessary to have some kind of border controls, if not passport controls, then probably at least customs controls on the border between Scotland and England. That doesn't look very nice. If Scotland is, leave it, is joining the EU from outside, then at least under the current rules, it would have to accept the euro. Uh, it would have to uh, uh, buy into various other things that currently the UK has uh, um, uh, opt-outs from. Uh, so all of that would make um, Scottish independence very unattractive. So we create the danger that, we, that Scotland ends up unhappier but more stuck huh. in the UK, which is a big, big problem. N Northern Ireland has, all, all the same things apply in Northern Ireland as well. Hmm. Add to that the issue that um, the great thing that has happened in Northern Ireland over the last 20 years is that the saliency of the border issue has mm -hmm. considerably declined. And that has been greatly helped by the joint membership of the two countries in the European Union. If suddenly we have an EU border oh. between Northern Ireland and the Republic, 
uh, then that issue of which country Northern Ireland is in becomes hugely more salient and potentially there are big dangers there. On a part of law, does the devolution legislation creating the Northern Ireland uh, Assembly, uh, does it contain a clause similar to the one creating the Scottish Parliament with regard to respectful EU law? I'm looking at Catherine for confirmation, but I think it, I'm pretty sure that all three do. I'm pretty sure uh, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland all have the same. European Court of Human Rights, the European Convention. Yes, fundamental. Yes. Yes. Other issue. Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, this evening for uh, being with us at the Lugartan Institute. Um, it's uh, been an evening when we've been able to at least elucidate some of the nature of the problems that have arisen out of the situation in which we do find ourselves. One of the things that I found most odd about the referendum uh, debate was the way in which this country, famously the, the home of empiricism and the balanced order and on the one hand this and on the other and reverence for facts suddenly became filled with the frenzy of theorizing. Uh, we've had hardly any uh, frenzy here this evening, though quite clearly we could have danced all night around these constitutional angels on a pin. Uh, we haven't had general doctrine, we've had the return of facts to the center of our debate. And facts are rather wonderful things because you can't just argue them away out of wishful thinking and theoretical delights. Thank you very much for your company and an especially uh, big thank you to our panel here this evening, to uh, all three of them for the expertise that they've brought to this complex issue. Thank you.